Welcome to the worship service for Sunday the 24th of January. Together we represent the congregations of the West End and City Centre of Aberdeen and we're delighted that you're able to join us for this time of worship. Taking part in leading our service today are myself, Jay Thomas, the Shared Youth Ministry Leader for Aberdeen West End Churches, Mike Lees, the Joint Session Clerk at Queen's Cross Church, Duncan Eddy, Minister at Holborn West, and Tanya Webster, Minister of Midstock at Church. Wherever and however you're joining us today, you're most welcome. Looking ahead to next Sunday, we'll be providing two online services. Our usual joint service and Robert Smith, the Minister at Ruby's Law, will also be leading us in an online communion service. Both will be available here on YouTube and I'm sure each of the congregations will share a link to the services on our social media channels too. We hope that you'll be able to connect in with both of these next Sunday. I also want to take the opportunity to share with you the launch of our new Virtual Sunday Club. During the ongoing COVID-19 restrictions, we're offering fun weekly activities for children and their families connected to the West End and City Centre congregations. Each week we'll share a video and some activities via a new Facebook group that we've set up. If you'd like to access these and be part of the group, then please follow the link in the description below. We begin our service with our call to worship. The Lord our God calls us to worship. We're called to gather together, to raise our hearts, our minds and voices to the Holy One. Come, praise the Lord, all you people. Offer this time to the one who calls us each by name. Let's look to God in prayer. Let's pray. Redeemer God, we gather as disciples of Jesus, called and invited to serve in the ongoing work of the kingdom. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Our time on earth is short compared to the eternal life to follow. And yet you give us this life and call us to use it in your service, like all those faithful servants before us and those still to come. We're part of the body of Christ, called and invited to serve. Like Peter, Andrew, James and John, as well as the other men and women Jesus called to serve, we're ordinary people with ordinary lives called to do something extraordinary. May we feel worthy of your call. May we trust that we can do all you ask. May we know that you will support us in all of it. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for the times when we have felt unworthy, for the times when we have not trusted or felt supported. Help us to always turn to you for help and guidance, trusting you will always answer us. May we always take refuge in your love and strength knowing that you're always with us. And as we respond to your call to follow, may we join together in sharing the prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it, the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and the Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The Testament reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, reading verses 14 through 20, the beginning of the Galilean ministry. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. 
As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Words. Words wield tremendous power for good and for evil. And we're well aware of words, I think, particularly with what's been happening in the United States, where many words have been spoken, many words that have been inflammatory and motivated and encourage people to do actions that have shocked many of us, the storming of the Capitol in Washington. It was wonderful this week to observe the inauguration of the new president, Joe Biden, and the words that were spoken were chosen carefully, they were considerate, and I hope that they will be helpful and healing for a nation which clearly has deep wounds and deep conflicts. They were words of a broad vision, starting from the personal, to the local community, to the state, to the nation, and inspiring a global vision of which the United States can play its part. There was an encouragement for people to hear, for people to follow and work together. And in that way, great things can be achieved. So we pray and hope for the nation of the United States that good things will come through the testing times they have experienced recently. Both the Book of Jonah and the Gospels tell us that there is power in words, there is power in preaching. And there is a danger that we can become cynical of that because of things like uh, fake news, distorted facts, and so much words and information being communicated to us in so many ways. Yet it is clear from the scriptures that the word is seen as important and that the words spoken can have a great power. Words can make an impact, they can change lives, they can sow seeds and enable new things to grow. Our words can proclaim a vision, they can articulate a dream, they can give us goals to work towards in Proverbs, we are given stark words which say, without vision, the people perish. In contrast, you could say that with vision, great things can be accomplished. Great things can be fulfilled, or in the words of the gospel, the kingdom of God. Let's consider briefly our readings from Jonah in the Gospel of Mark. The Bible attaches a great deal of importance to the word, to words. And we read of this in the uh, book of Ezekiel. And let me just share with you regarding that. This is a quote from Ezekiel from St. Augustine in his sermon on the shepherds. If you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, 
he shall die in his iniquity, but you shall have saved your life. In Ezekiel, we're given that picture that we are watchmen with a great responsibility before us. And so we come to the book of Jonah. And we come to a reluctant messenger, a reluctant prophet, who, if you read the whole of the book, it's just full of amazing incidents. It's full of surprises and shocks and twists and turns. And it's one of my favourite books uh, in the Bible. Because in many ways it reflects so many aspects of our human nature. Jonah, when he's told to go to Nineveh and tell them about the judgment that is facing them, he doesn't want to do it. He wants to go the other way. And this is expressed very well in verse by the American poet Thomas John Carlyle. The word came and he went in the other direction. God said, cry tears of compassion, tears of repentance. Cry against the reek of unrighteousness. Cry for the right turn, the contrite spirit. And Jonah rose and fled in tearless silence. He rose and fled in tearless silence. He jumped in a boat. He was thrown off the boat by the crew and he was swallowed by a great big fish and spewed out on the shore of Nineveh and had to make his way there the second time. Sometimes we need a second time. Sometimes we need second thoughts. And I think God in his grace and his love sometimes gives us that second opportunity to make a right for our previous wrongs. So often, we, like Jonah, want to hide. We want someone else to do the work, dirty work, someone else to do the speaking, particularly if it involves confronting or rebuking. That's a hard thing for us to do, so we shy away from it. And um, I, I, I read um, from uh, Father Bill Anderson uh, in his reflection on the book of Jonah, and I thought these were wonderful words. Strange, isn't it, how slow we are to work for another's amendment when we should? Yet, how swift to criticise the offender <laughs> behind his back when we most certainly shouldn't. We struggle to confront face to face. Jonah had to do that. He tried to run away from it. And the reality is that we, as people seeking to follow Christ, have to at times confront that which is clearly wrong. Let's think a bit more about the story of Jonah. He, as I said, eventually does go and preach to them. He starts to make his way into the city, into the suburbs. And lo and behold, they respond to Jonah's preaching. They believe in God and turn aside from the evil. So radical is their response, they pass on the prophetic message to their friends and neighbours. And the king and his council hear it and they also respond. But it's worth noting that initially this was to the outskirts, to the suburbs of Nineveh, and word spread. When we evangelise, when we proclaim, we don't realise the impact it can be having, how people's lives can be altered, can be changed, and if they find something worthwhile, they will share it. And so it happened in Nineveh, the city that was waiting for judgment. And so the royal proclamation calls for a change of heart, a turning from evil and the defeat of violence. And God relents and decides not to punish the city. So the focal point, interestingly, is found in these different people throughout the city. 
which eventually goes to the centre and it has a huge impact. People sharing a common need and a common capacity. The common need is for God. The common capacity is their ability to repent. In Jesus' calling of the fishermen, there is a losing and a finding, a letting go and a letting God, a leaving of their families, their nets, to a discovering of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And so the fishermen go through a conversion, literally a turning around. Let me read these words uh, by Jim Wallace, which uh, I think express in a very profound way what conversion is about. In the larger rhythm of turning from and turning to, repentance is the turning away from. Repentance turns us from sin, selfishness, darkness, idols, habits, bondages and demons, both public and private. We turn from all that binds and oppresses us and others, from all the violence and evil in which we are so complicit, from all the false worship which has controlled and corrupted us. Ultimately, repentance is turning from the powers of death. They no longer hold us. Conversion leads to faith. Faith is turning to belief, hope and trust. Faith opens up our future by restoring our sight, softening our hearts, bringing light to our darkness. We are converted to compassion, justice and peace as we take our stand as citizens of Christ's new order. And let me just uh, close with these words by Albert Schweitzer about life choices that we and everyone has. He comes to us as one unknown. As of old, he came by the lakeside to those who knew him not. He speaks to us the same words, follow me. And to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, they will learn in their own experience, in the toils and conflicts they pass through in his fellowship, who he is. May we hear afresh the call of Jesus to follow him. And may we have that joy of working together to find to make his kingdom of God here on earth. May God bless you in his service. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy One, God of all creation, you call us to be your people, to carry your vision in this time and place, to go where you send us, to help welcome your amazing good news. Fill us with your glorious spirit that we may share your good news with a world that is in need. You made us all. We are your creation. People formed in your image as individuals, as community. Formed and fed and furnished with understanding of who you are and who and whose we are. We have heard you speak in us and through others. God of all our moments of our days and our nights, you speak and you act in the world around us to direct and guide us in the way of healing and wholeness. Help us to open our eyes, our ears and our hearts to your presence every day. Lord, we pray that we may show renewed commitment to answer your call, to be instruments of your grace and love. We pray for those who consider themselves inadequate or insufficient to do your will. Give them new vision, a vision in which you are their strength and their hope. We pray too for all those in want and need, for those of us and of the larger community who suffer in body or in soul. When the buzz of the world and the media interrupts our lives and fills our ears, may we hear your voice and follow your ways. When the complaints of others settle in our mind and cloud our vision, show us your vision for our lives. When the cries of the poor, the oppressed and the outcast pierce our hearts, Guide us in your example of helping others. Fill our hearts, fill our eyes and ears with your love. Let us be your hands and your feet in the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now may the blessing of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those whom you love near and far away, now and always. Amen.